Hi friends, Apostle Price here. This year, we are celebrating 35 years of ever-increasing faith television. We are still walking by faith. During this year, we will air some of our most popular classic series from years gone by. Remember, you have made it happen for the past 35 years. I appreciate your loyalty. Stay with us and enjoy my classic teachings. Get involved. Visit faithdome.org for more details. From Los Angeles, California, ever increasing faith with pastor and teacher, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. Let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Now we have been teaching on and we are presently engaged in the subject, teaching on the subject, the Christian family. And as the title implies, we are dealing with the family that God ordained and instituted in the very beginning. And as I said last time, I also will make reference to it now, that even though you may be a single person, a person that is not yet married or a person wh who may decide not to ever marry, you are still included in this because you are in the family of God. And even though the Bible does not have a whole lot to say specifically directed to singles as it does to husbands and wives and parents and children, yet you are still obligated by the word of God to live a sanctified and holy set apart life unto God through the word of God. So you're still included. And whatever fits the husband or fits the wife or fits the parents would also fit you from a single point of view. So don't feel like you're left out. I also want to say, as I have been saying from the very outset of this series, that I would guess I would classify this series in the PG category. That's my designation, in the PG category. I would not consider it X-rated. I would not consider it R-rated yet some probably would do so. And so I want to set the stage and clear the air because I know that there are people that are watching who have children that watch the television program and I, I have no desire to offend you as a parent or offend your children, nor do I have a desire to say anything that would be misconstrued as being what we might call raunchy. That's not my purpose. But I do know by experience that people by and large are unable to discuss things concerning intimate family relationships, especially the area of sex and sexual things in a public forum. They, they cannot deal with it. They, they can't discuss it themselves and they become very intimidated when somebody else discusses them. And so I want to forewarn you because I don't even know who's here today. We always have visitors and you may have young people with you. I don't always know in the series until I get to that specific area, I will be talking about sex as a subject itself related to the overall subject of the Christian family but as we move along and we talk about the duties of the husband the duties of the wife we certainly at certain points are going to end up talking about these areas and I only have a desire to share in a way that will help to free up some people to help to give some insights into uh, these certain areas so that people can live a life of freedom and victory in the things of God and so what, and you know, like the old saying goes, beauty is in the eye of the, of the beholder. Something may be beautiful to one person and be very obnoxious or ugly to somebody else. So what you may call uh, vulgar is not necessarily vulgar just because you think it's so. Okay? And so I don't think it is. The discussion of facts I don't believe are vulgar. Now there are vulgar ways of expressing, expressing facts. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, I could talk about... Uh, <laughs> I, I could talk about 
now don't be offended by this now, but I'm trying to give you an illustration. I could talk about the male penis. Now that's a technical term. I mean, that's a scientific term. That's not a vulgar term. But now there are certain words that you use out on the street that refer to that particular male organ that if I use those terms, then I personally would consider that to be a vulgar expression in the context of something like this. But to use dictionary terms, scientific term, I don't see where that's vulgar. Now you may, but I want you to be forewarned that I want to deal with this subject close to where we live only for the purpose not to be sensational or not to be uh, vulgar or to hurt anyone's feelings. So I want to forewarn you so that you'll save your time and your stamps. Don't write me a lot of letters telling me what I ought to do and how I ought to talk and what I ought to say. I don't get my assignment from you. God has given me my assignment and I have to answer to him. So I'm doing my very best to be truthful and yet at the same time be as transparent and as explicit as possible for the purpose of helping you. And I do this out of years of experience of being a minister and a pastor and having to listen to your problems. And a lot of you, if these things had been discussed somewhere along your journey as you've journeyed along the pathway of life, you might not be in the mess you're in now and you might have been able to avoid some of the messes that you have been in and still trying to get out of. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I said, can I get an amen? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. So be forewarned. All right. We've already discussed marriage, a divine institution. We've already talked about marriage and divorce, the obligation of it. I gave you what I call another view of divorce, gave you scriptures to support it. And we're now engaged in the discussion of the duties of the husband. The duties of the husband. In our last lesson, we left off talking about a particular verse, namely the 21st verse in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. It says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear or reverence of God. Let's read that together. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, there has been a great emphasis in recent years on the idea of the submission of the wife to the husband. And indeed, the Bible most certainly does say that there is a place for the wife to submit to the husband. But then I believe this verse makes it very plain that it is a two-way street, not a one-way street, Amen. but a two-way street. It says submitting yourself one to another. Now, I was about to give you my definition of submitting or submission. Because sometimes we read words in the Bible that are not used as much today as they were when the Bible was first written. And so in order that we understand one another and so that you will understand where I'm coming from and what I mean by the terms that I use, I want to give you a, what I call an up-to-date definition of the word submission because we don't use it in, you know, generally speaking, we don't use it in everyday conversation. But the word submit is the same, means the same thing as the signs that you sometimes see when you come to an intersection where there is no traffic control light, no stop sign or whatever, but you may see a sign and it will say yield, which means yield the right of way, which really means let the other person go first. Well, that's what submit means. It means to let the other person go first. Now, when you have an intersection where the sign says yield, and one is going in one direction and one is going in the opposite cross direction and, and nobody yields, you could have a crack up in the intersection. You could have a wreck. And that's what's happening to many people's lives. Because neither one is willing to yield, they're having confrontations and they're having crack ups in the intersections of their married lives. And it's unfortunate and it's unnecessary. And if we would ab adopt this biblical principle, of yielding one to another, then we would always let, I'd let the wife go first, she'd let me go first. That way we'd never run into one another. There would never be a confrontation situation as such. It would always be giving deference to the other party. So the submission works in both directions. It is not that a woman or a wife should submit to her husband anymore than he should submit to her. There is an equality. And a husband a husband, you husband, are wrong if you expect your wife to submit to you without you submitting to her. That is an out-of-balance situation. 
and it will not produce the kind of end results that you really want to see. It's going to be confusion. So submission is on both sides of the ledger, if you would. So I must submit to my wife, my wife must submit to me. It says submitting yourselves where? One to another. All right, let's move on to something else now in reference to the duties of the husband. Let's look now at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and at the same time or in conjunction with that find 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Timothy 5. And we will look at those verses in that order. First Corinthians, the 11th chapter. <clears throat> We're talking about the subject of the Christian family. We're talking now about the duties of the wife or the husband. Duties of the husband. We will talk about the duties of the wife at a later date. So if you're here for the very first time and, and you're a female or a wife or a potential wife and you may... Uh, think that, well, now you're talking about one side, but what about the other side? Or I should say you're a man, maybe a husband, and you're saying, are you getting on us, Brother Pride? Well, what about the wives? Their turn will come. <laughs> Their time is rapidly approaching. So just as we used to say on the street, just lay dead and play cool. And everything will be all right, and you'll find out about all of them. All right, now, duties of the husband. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. It says, but I would have you know that the head of what? Every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, I'm reading from the King James Bible, and I'm sure that the majority of people here are, and perhaps those that are watching by television. But there needs to be a clarification here. There, there needs to be a qualification, if you would. Because what it is, what it appears to be saying is that the man is the head of the woman. I mean, that's exactly what it says on the page. <laughs> the man is the head of the woman. But is that really what it's saying? Well, no, it's not. Because, you see, if, it, if it's meant that, if it meant that the man is the head of the woman, then that would mean that every man is the head of every woman. Well, that, wouldn't, that couldn't be right. No way in the world. Because see, if I'm the head of the woman, then that makes, me, that makes me the head of Al's wife here. And I know better than that. <laughs> I don't want to get hurt. Huh? That makes me the head of Wanza. I know Calvin ain't going for that. No way. So you see, you, the, thing, the terms have to be qualified. See, the way it's stated, it sounds like what it's saying is that, that the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Now, I submit to you that what this section of Scripture, I'm only using one verse because I'm dealing with the duties of the husband. So I'm trying to show things that, are, that pertain to the husband. If I was studying on another subject, then I would use everything in the verse, uh, in this section here. But now, you have to understand what's being dealt with. There is a principle that is being enunciated here. That principle is the principle of rank. R-A-N-K, rank, you know, like you have the general, you have, I'm, I'm surely not saying this in order because I was never in the military, so I don't know anything about the order, but I, I have heard of generals, I've heard of captains, I've heard of colonels, I've heard of lieutenants, I've heard of majors, I've heard of sergeants, and I've heard of privates, okay? My understanding of that is that each one of them has a different rank, okay? They each have a different rank. Now, I submit to you that what this is talking about here is rank and it is showing God's divine order now anything that supersedes God's divine order is out of order and when you are out of order with God's divine order you are courting disaster fast okay you're out of balance and it won't work for long and it certainly will not work as it's supposed to work. So what this section is dealing with, it's dealing with a principle. And that principle is the principle of rank. Now notice what it says. It says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. 
Well, you see, if you just take that at face value, then that means that Christ is the head of every man in the world. So if that's true, then that means that Christ is the head of the sinner. The non-Christian man. Christ is the head of the non-Christian man. But he's not. Christ is only the head of his family. I said Christ is only the head of his family. He is not the head of Satan's family. The unsaved man, the man who has never personally accepted or confessed Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. That individual man or person who has never been born again. Satan is your father, spiritually speaking. Okay? Almighty God is not your father. Almighty God is not anybody's father until you are adopted into his family. Then and only then does he become your legal guardian. Only then does he become your father and you become his child. See, there is an erroneous doctrine that has been promulgated down through the years called the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That we're all brothers, that God is the father of all of us and that we're all brothers. That is a lie spawned in the pit of hell itself. God is not everybody's father. Now God is creator. But God created the rocks. He sure ain't their father. Rocks don't have fathers. Okay, but he's the creator. So God is the creator. But he's not the father of everybody. See, he's not your father unless you're his child. And you can't be his child unless you've been adopted into his family. And the only way you can be adopted into his family is you have to go through the adoption agency and adoption procedures. And the adoption procedures are he must be born again. And the adoption agency is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you haven't gone through that, then you're not in the family of God. Therefore, God is not your father. Yes, he's your creator. But you're not a child of God unless you've been born again. Okay? Now... And you can find that if you want to look it up in, in the Gospel of John chapter one, uh, chapter 1 verse 12. You'll find that. Okay? I don't have time to go into that. But the point is that Jesus is not the head of every man. He's only the head of his family. See, he's, this is talking about rank. He is the head of his family. Now, if you're not in the family, then he's not your head. Satan, spiritually speaking, is your head if you're not a Christian. If you've never been born again, then Satan is your spiritual father. Hmm? Whether you want him to be or not, he's still that. A whole lot of folks have had earthly fathers, and when they saw how their fathers acted, they didn't want them to be their fathers either. They wish somebody else was their father. But I don't care what you say, that's your pappy. That's your daddy. That's your earthly creator, if you would. Him's the one responsible for you, especially if you're a male child. Definitely he's your <laughs> creator in that sense, you know, as a father. All right. Now, so it's obvious then, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. No, Christ is only the head of his family. Now, let me show you something here that you may or may not be aware of. You see, when you read the Bible, you have to realize and, and you have to qualify to whom is it written. See, And then you include yourself in, in that group if that's the group you're supposed to be in. See, the Bible is not a book written to people. The Bible is a book that's written to the children of God. It's a coded language. Only family members can really understand this message. Only family members have the capacity to understand the message. It is not a book for the world at large. It is not a general treatise of human history. It is not a book that can be studied in some university. as a religious treatise. That's a fallacy. This book is God's book to God's people. So if you're not in the family of God, you can't even begin to understand it. You don't even have the capacity to understand it, as long as you're not in the family of God. So you have to understand to whom the book is written. Now you, under you have to understand that the book of 1 Corinthians, and that's what we're reading right now, was written to the church in a place called Corinth. It's the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. So it's written to Christians. 
ultimately to all Christians throughout all time and history. It's not written to the world. It's written to children of God. So you have to understand then, when it says here, for instance, but I would have you know that the head of every man, that every man would be every Christian man, every born again man, every man that has been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. Not every man on the planet, but only every man in the family of God. See, you have to understand that and qualify it, otherwise it won't have its meaning or the meaning that it ought to have. All right, now notice. He says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. He's talking about Christian man. Now, again, let me reemphasize this section in this verse is showing us about rank. Okay? It's showing us about rank so that we'll understand the divine order. Now, it says... Again, but I would have you know that the head of every man, every Christian man, is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. As I pointed out earlier, if that statement means what it says, that the head of every woman is the man, then that would make every man the head of every woman. That couldn't be true. That would, be, that would mean an unsaved man who's not even in the family would be the head of my wife. You know. <laughs> I mean, you know that you know. That couldn't be true. Mm -mm. <laughs> no way. All right. How do, we, how do we deal with this? All right. What you have to realize is that in the original writing of the Bible, most of your major manuscripts from which the English Bible, King James included, English Bible was translated, were written in Greek. Not all of them, but the majority of your major ones were written in the Greek language. And you have to understand that in different languages, words have different meanings. Now, it's very interesting that the word in the Greek for woman is the same word for wife. The same word. It means wife in one place. It means woman in another place. Now, all wives are women, but all women are not wives. You know, I mean, if a woman is not married, then she's not a wife, right? So you have to, you have to understand that principle. That every, that, that the word woman, whenever you see it in the New Testament, the word woman and the word wife carry the same original Greek word. One word. And that word means, in one situation, wife. But then in another situation, it means woman. Now, how do you make the distinction between the two? Glad you asked the question. The way that you make the distinction is by noting the context in which you find the statement. The context will qualify whether it's talking about women or talking about wives. In this case, I submit to you, and if you read the whole chapter, and I don't, I don't have time because that's not the subject, but if you would read the whole chapter, you will find out very clearly that he's talking here about the differential between the husband and the wife and Christ and God. Amen. He's not talking about women as women, but about wives. Now it makes more sense if you read it this way. But I would have you know that the head of every Christian man, every born again man, is Christ. And the head of every wife is the husband. And the head of Christ is God. That's what it's talking about. And what it's doing is showing us rank. God is over all. Jesus is under God. Then under Christ, and of course the Holy Spirit in terms of rank is under, under Christ. But here he only uses God in Christ. Therefore the progression would be God's over all. Jesus is second. And then behind Jesus or under Christ is the husband. And under the husband is the wife. And under the wife are the children as far as rank is concerned. And the purpose of it is to show the responsibility that each position in this rank and file carry. See, you may have a rank, but there also goes with that rank a tremendous responsibility. And if you don't discharge your duty in that rank, you can mess up a whole lot of folk. 
See, God is over all. Christ is under God. Then the man or the husband is under Christ and the wife is under the husband and the children are under the wife. That's the way the rank goes. Now, there's a purpose for that. The purpose is to show the responsibility of the husband. If the husband is the head of the wife, then that means he's responsible for the wife. God is holding you husbands responsible for your wives. You are responsible for loving them, taking care of them, providing for them, and protecting them in the domestic environment. Understand that. That's as far as it goes, only in the domestic aspect of life. The husband is not the spiritual head of his wife. Now, there's a lot of business on that. A lot of folk talking about the husband is the, is the, is the, um, the priest of the house and all that. Husband ain't no priest in no house. How are you going to be a priest? You have no anointing to be a priest. Not in that sense. Not the way people are talking about it in terms that he is a spiritual head. The only spiritual head in anybody's, in any Christian home is Jesus. Jesus is the head. God is not entrusting no priesthood or the priesthood to some man. Priests went out with Jesus. Now all of us together, corporately, are a nation of priests. But that's because Jesus is the priest. And we're the body of Christ. Whatever my arm. See, my arm is as much pastor of Crenshaw Christian Center as my foot is. Because my arm and my foot are part of the same body. So in that sense, all of me is pastor of Crenshaw Christian Center. My fingers and my ears are alike. They're all a part of the same body. Well, we are all individually members in the body of Christ. So in that sense, we are a, a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood, but we are that because Jesus is. Can you understand that? But the priest of my house, spiritually speaking, is Christ. Because if I am the priest of my wife, who's my priest? If I'm, my, if I'm the spiritual priest of my wife, who's my priest? I say, what? Who's my priest? Who is the priest of the husband? Oh, Jesus is the man's priest, but the man is the woman's priest. You gotta be joking. Huh? You have to be joking. Oh no. Jesus is the head. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is spiritually speaking the priest of every one of us. And no man can usurp the authority of the priest of all the ages, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where a whole lot of folk get into some problems. That's where some women, Christian women who are married to non-Christian husbands, that's where they get into a whole lot of stuff. And folks are going around telling women, you're supposed to submit to your husband. How are you going to submit to somebody that's spiritually dead? You got an unsaved husband, husband, he doesn't even qualify to be your head. He doesn't, he's he not your head. Not in that sense. Not according to God's order, he's not. Now, from societal standpoint, from civic authority, he's the head. He's the husband. But you mean to tell me, you you're going to tell me that God is going to take his blood-bought, blood-washed, spirit-filled child... And put that child under the dominion of a satanically inspired and controlled and directed individual. You gotta be choking. You can't be that stupid. Even though you look that stupid. You that stupid. And I didn't call anybody's name. So I didn't call anybody's name. Okay. The only person that has any business telling you when to read the Bible, when not to read the Bible, when to go to church, when not to go to church, whether you can tithe or whether you cannot tithe, is Jesus Christ. Because your husband did not redeem you, didn't save you, and didn't die for you, therefore he has no right to tell you what to do spiritually. Now, I do believe this, that I, as a spiritual individual, ought to be the example in my home. I ought to be the leader because I'm the head domestically. I ought to head up everything else in terms of being an example to my wife and to my children. But I can't tell my wife, you can pray now. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want you praying between the hours of four and five. You're supposed to fix my dinner. I don't agree with that. Now, I have no problem if you want to knuckle under to that and go ahead and let your husband tell you that. No sweat off my nose. No problem. Let's just don't, let's don't fall out. But as far as I can see from the word of God, God is not entrusting the lives of his children into the hands of the devil. Huh? 
there? No, 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 a thousand times no. Mm -mm. All right, now, he says here, he says, but I would have you know that the head of every man, Christian man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. The head of the wife is the husband, and the head of Christ is God. Now that again is domestically speaking. Husband, you are responsible for providing for your wife. You're responsible for taking care of her. You're responsible pro for providing a home for her. Now I'm going to meddle now. I know you're going to get upset. I know you're going to have a fit about this. I know that some of you are just going to have, I mean, I don't know what might happen. I hope you don't have a car in there. <laughs> but remember that I'm not God. And, and thank God I'm not going to stand in the day of judgment and judge you. Amen. Man, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I don't have that responsibility. I'm not your judge. But right now, while you're submitted to me, I'm your teacher. So I'm just simply going to share with you what I believe the Word of God is saying. You can interpret it another way, and it doesn't bother me in the least. I have no problem with it at all. But now, a lot of men want to run around talking about, I'm the head. See, the Bible said right there, I'm the head. See, I'm the head. I'm the head. Fine. That's great. But remember that headship carries with it responsibility. Now, if you're going to be the head, then you're going to have to act like the head. And until you act like the head, you better be careful about mouthing off about you're the head. Now, let me ask you a question. Who provides for us, ourselves or Christ? Christ. What'd you say? Christ. I didn't hear you. Christ. I, I didn't hear you. Christ. Why are you whispering? What did you say? Oh, Christ? Oh, all right, if that's true then, who provides for Christ? God. The Father. Would you agree with that? Yes. Watch your mouth now. Here we go with rank. God, Christ, the husband. All right, if God provides for Christ and Christ provides for the husband, then the husband should provide for the wife. Now that's the rank. Therefore, husband, if you are not providing for your wife, then you are not actually yet qualifying as head. Amen. Okay, watch it now. You want to you wanna run around talking about, I'm the head, I'm the head. Me, Tarzan, Eugene. Ah! I'm the head. Okay, if you're the head, the responsibility that goes with headship is to provide for your family, to take care of your wife, to provide all of the necessities and desires of her heart that are within the scope of the husband's relationship. And I submit unto you that if you're not doing that, you don't yet qualify as the head. Because if you have to have your wife work, if you have to have your wife work in order for your family to subsist and make it, then that means that that family has two heads. And, and that makes for a Frankenstein monster, and God has not made any two-headed animals of any kind. Anytime you see something that has two heads on it, you have a freak of nature. <laughs> now you want to be the head? Take care of your woman. Take care of your family. Don't misunderstand me. Now, let me clarify this. I am not opposed to women working. I am not opposed to wives working. That's your problem. Do whatever you want. I have no problem with that. But if she's working because you can't take care of her, then you're not acting as the head. Now, understand what I'm saying. See, now, now watch this. You're going to learn something. You're going to learn something that's worth $10 million to you. See, watch this. I told you already when we first started out, I mean, just... Today, in this lesson, I told you that we were going for God's best. That we were going for God's way of doing it. See, here's what has happened, and this is the sad thing with Christians. Christians have fallen into the malaise 
of allowing sitcoms to dictate to them how they run their families. They have allowed the edge of night and general hospital and as the world turned and dynasty and all of the rest of them, we have allowed those things to dictate what family life is all about. We have not gone to the Word of God, by and large. We have not allowed the Word of God to dictate to us and direct our home, but we've allowed the world to tell us how a family ought to run. And in the world, everybody works, even the dog and the cat and the goldfish. Now, now, why, why do they all have to work? They all have to work because they themselves are their own source. And if they don't have enough source coming in, they cannot have two cars. They cannot have a color TV in every room. They cannot have this and they cannot have that and they cannot have the other. But dear friend, I'm here to tell you that we are not our own source, but God is our source. Now, again, hey, you know, be cool now. This is just my opinion. You don't have to go for this. You say, I disagree. Fine. It's okay. I'm not telling your wife to stop working. I'm not telling you women not to work. I'm poor. All I'm dealing with is God's order and rank. The head of Christ is God. The head of the husband is Christ. And the head of the woman or the wife is the man. Now, if you're the head, then you should provide for your head like our head provides for us. And if you're not providing like that, then you're, you're really not qualified to be the head. If, you have, if, if your whole economic situation is structured on your wife working, that means she's bringing money in, you're bringing money in, and that's what's causing your relationship to work, then that means you've got two heads there. She has as much right then to make the decisions as you do. You, you, there's no way you can be the head. Because it's not by your labor that that family subsists. Now, 99% of the time, the only reason that all of you work in the cat, the dog, and the goldfish is because you want things. And there's nothing wrong with things. Don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with having two cars. Mercedes in, in one side of the garage and a Rolls Royce in the other. No problem. Or two Rolls if you like them. Or two Mercedes if you like them. There's no, God's not opposed to that. But I believe there's a way to do it. My wife has never worked. When I say never worked, she tried to work one time. She wanted to work. And I'll get into that when I get into this part of the series called the division of labor within the home. She wanted to work, but I discouraged her. I cured her of that. <laughs> I cured her of that a long time ago. Now, she works now in the ministry with me. Okay? But she works as her choice. I don't require her to work. I take care of her. In fact, all the money that she makes is her own money that she puts in her own account to spend on whatever she wants to. I still buy her clothes. I still take care of the house. I still do everything else. That's her money. She flush it down the toilet if she wants to. But she has, she has a vested interest in the ministry. And so our little boy is in, we have him in a very fine school. And so uh, the other, uh, the oldest girl that stays home, Stephanie, is working. The other two girls are married. There's nothing for her to do at home. I have a housekeeper for her, take care of the house. And so what's she going to do? Just sit around and twiddle her thumbs all day? So she wanted to be involved in something. But her working is not out of necessity. She's not working because if she doesn't, we're going under financially. Do you understand the difference? See the difference there? Now, there might be a number of reasons why your wife works. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's conceivable that maybe you, uh, you're going with one another, uh, you're courting one another, and the guy's already in, 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 in school, and he's just got a couple of more years to finish his schooling or something like that. And maybe the woman, the girl, is already has a very good job, and they want to get married, and they agree, okay, I'm gonna, I'll work and finish. You, you can go ahead and finish your schooling without interruption. You can go full-time, and I'll take care of everything. There's no, that's a different kind of thing. Are you, are you following me? In my mind, it's a different kind of thing. It might not be in yours, but in mine it is. But what I'm saying, before I can start crowing about I'm the head, I'm the head, then I ought to be taking headship responsibility and I ought to be the main man taking care of my wife and my children. Then I can stand as the head at the helm and I can say, I am the head. Okay? I'm saying that if you're not doing that, then you haven't, you're not arriving yet at headship. And I'm here to tell you, God will bless you. You can be blessed. You don't, both of you don't have to work. Now, again, I'm not telling you to stop right now. Are you saying? But you have to have, you, this is where faith comes in. See, I, I never wanted, everybody's different. I never wanted my children to come home to an empty house from school. Now, that's just me. 
different strokes for different folks, okay? And there's some situation where people don't have any choice. You may have a single parent and poor, thank God that woman's willing to work instead of just lie on her backside and draw welfare. You know, she's willing to go out and work, so she has to work and then she has to make some kind of arrangements for the kids. Okay, I, that's unfortunate. Thank God they're willing to do that. Man, I just, you know, just putting the kids out on the street. But that's not the ideal. That's all I'm saying. It's not the, it's not the ideal. It's not God's best. And it's not going to produce the very best. And that's why society is all screwed up. It's why it's all messed up. Because the homes are messed up. They are not functioning as God designed the home to function. Okay? And I refuse, I refuse to accept this garbage about, well, you know, that's the way it is, and this, that, and the other. I'm not going to accept less than God's best. Okay? I'm going to always set my sights for the very best. Yes, it's going to take some time to reach it. But I'll tell you what, if you never set your sights for the best, you ain't never going to reach it. You don't stand a chance to ever get there. You're going to have to set the goal and work towards reaching that goal. And I did that. We went without a whole lot of stuff. But I tell you one thing we had in our house. We had love. We had love. We had concern. We had tender, loving care in that house. We didn't all, I couldn't always pay the bills. But we had agreement there and we were together in that. And God has brought us out into a, into a wide pasture land now. Every need is met and every bill is paid. Because we learn how to walk in God's divine way. Huh? Now... I told you to look at 1 Timothy 5. Now let me show you another verse that will go right along with 1 Corinthians 11 and you'll be able to see what I've been talking about. Okay? Now I'm not trying to wreck anybody's home. Don't, you wives, don't act crazy now and go home and say, I ain't going to work no more. I'm going to stop working. <laughs> Pastor Price told me to quit my job. Don't you tell that lie. <laughs> don't you tell that lie and have Godzilla coming after me. <laughs> Uh-uh. All I'm doing, I'm showing you God's best. Now, it's up to you whether you want to go for it. If you don't, fine. It's all right with me. But I know it'll produce the best and lasting results. Like I said, there are a number of reasons why a woman would need to work. Okay? You know that. But I'm dealing with you to be honest in your heart. If, all, if the only reason your wife is working, and all of it's because of a bunch of things that you want. And really, you're not trusting God to get you the things. You're trusting your own labor. And if you can do it, you don't even need the Lord. You don't need faith. You don't need the covenant. If you're going to do it yourself. See what I mean? Now, it's not wrong. It's just not the best. It's not God's best. That's all I'm talking about. It's not God's best. Okay? If the only reason she's working is just for the accumulation of creature comforts. And you've got the system set up so much that if she stops working your whole financial empire comes crumbling down, then you're not yet, you're not yet operating as the head. I'll say it again. If, you, if your wife has to work and she has to put that money in, without it, you can't make it, then the house has two heads. And that's not God's best. I didn't say it's wrong, but it's not God's best. I mean, it's not wrong if I go out into a field and I take my bare hand and start plowing the ground with it. That's not wrong, but that sure ain't the best. I mean, that ain't the best. You know, I fool around and I can dig some holes in the ground to plant seed in, but that's sure not the best. It's not wrong. It's not a sin, but it's not God's best. And there ain't no anointing on my hand. <laughs> okay, now watch this. 1 Timothy 5. Watch this now. Are you ready for it? Do you have your seat belts fastened? Yeah. Wait a minute. Let me, get up, let me get up here and see if I, I want to be sure everybody's got their seat belt. You all got your seat belts on? Got your seat belts on? Yeah. Because I'm getting ready to read a verse now that will dovetail into what I've just finished saying. Some of you are already hostile now. You disagree with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you too. You're already hostile. But I'm going to show you something from the Bible. So get mad and pull this page out of the Bible. Okay? Okay, watch this now. Watch it. What, I said that the, we were looking at the, at the Word, and it talks about that God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the husband. The husband is the head of the wife. 
Okay, if you're the head, there is responsibility that goes along with being a head. See, there's a responsibility being a general that's greater than being a private. Huh? See, if the private screws it up, he can always say, the sergeant. <laughs> you know, if the sergeant screws it up, he can always say, what's the next one after, after the... The what? You can always say, the lieutenant. If the lieutenant messes it up, he can always say the what? Captain. captain. See the captain. If the captain fouls it up, he can always say what? Major. See the major. <laughs> if the major messes it up, he can always say, see the what? The, the what? Colonel. The colonel. And when the colonel messes it up, he can always say, see the... <laughs> and if the general messes it up, he can always say, see the what? The president. He is the commander in chief of the armed forces. But guess what? The buck stops with El Presidente. That's it. So there is a responsibility that goes with being the head. You want to be the head of your, oh yeah, I'm the head of the house. Fine, then act like it. Take your authority and take your responsibility along with it. Do it. In fact, when you do that, you won't even have to say you're the head. Everybody will know that's the head. Hmm? All right. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Can you read? Can you read? I didn't write it. Notice Fred Price's name doesn't appear in there. Notice what it says. But if any provide not for his own. Now watch this. Let me show you a revelation. Let me show you a re revelation. Notice what it doesn't say. It does not say. But if any provide not for her own. Masculine gender is used. His. See, the word any would mean man or woman. Would mean man or woman. So when he says any. But then he brings it down home. He says, but if any provide not for his own. Why does he say that? Because going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the husband is the head of the wife. You are supposed to be the provider. In fact, if you can't take care of her, you ain't got no business marrying her. See, now I want to show you something again. I, I said this earlier, but let me reemphasize it because it will help some of you that are yet on the road towards marriage. See, everything we think of, we think of it in the context of experiential knowledge. And we think of things based on what we've already seen around us. And the system is designed so that, you know, if you expect to have any creature comforts in the natural, both of you almost have to work. But there is a way. There is a price to pay to get in that way. You may not be willing and ready to pay that price. But it works. I'm a living witness of it. I'm a living witness. It works. But you have to have some conviction about it. And you have to be willing to pay the price. I am the head of my house. I provide for my family, for my children. I have provided. I have always done the very best because I didn't know the best. But since I found out about the best, since I found out and I know the best, honey, we've been moving towards the best and we in it now. Amen. And it has paid handsome dividends in the texture of our relationships and in the fabric of our union and with our <coughs> children. Paid handsome dividends. Handsome dividends. Absolutely handsome dividends. Now, 
See, he says here, and this is, I mean, this is awesome. Listen to this. But if any provide not for his own, and then the man brings it down, you can't get out of this. You'd have to hire somebody to help you misunderstand this one. Listen to this. And specially for those of his own house. He had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So that's talking about headship. You want to be the man of your house. You want to be the head of your home and take care of your responsibility and provide for your family. Provide for your wife. Now, I'll get into this later when I talk, when I get on the duties of the wife. I realize there's some women, you're not going to keep them home. You might as well forget it. They're not going to stay home. They're not going to take care of no babies. They're not going to wash no dishes and clean no house. They want to be men. They want to be on an equality with a man. And they're going to go out there in that job market, in that workplace, and they're going to work. A lot of them have abdicated their responsibility of womanhood or parenthood, motherhood, because it's a lot easier to punch a clock than to do women's work. Because women's work never gets done. Never. It's never done. It never stops. It goes on and on and on. It ain't never done. I mean, it's amazing. Some of you men, you ought to just spend some time following your wife around that house. You ought to spend some time examining and evaluating what your wife does. My wife, I, sometimes I tell her, what in the world is wrong with you? What's the matter with you? She never tell, I tell you, you better take you some time, honey, because that stuff's going to be there tomorrow morning. See, I found out a long time ago, I know how to relax. I know how to relax. Honey, that stuff will never, it never ends. It's going to always be there. There's going to always be some trash to take out. There's going to always be some, some furniture to clean. Man, I'm not going to let that stuff get me in bondage. I'm taking mine. When my day is off, I am off. O-F-F-F off. You hear me? Because that stuff never stops. That, that, the windows are going to get dirty again. The vanity will get dirty. The carpet needs vacuuming. The beds need changing. I mean, it never ends. It go, you talk about a cycle. It goes on and on and on. And if you don't learn how to take some time, take a vacation, get away from that stuff, you're going down the tubes. And I cannot believe that God intended life to be making up beds and washing windows all the time. Although they need to be done. But in their place. But I know there are a lot of women, they don't want to, they're not going to stay home. And I, some of you men, I'm sorry, you got one of them kind of women, you got a problem on your hand. Because they they're not going to stay home. They want to look cute all day and wear some designer clothes and be in that office all day long. And so they can punch that clock, there's no responsibility there. That's that man's company, that's that man's job. You punch that clock, go in, do your job, punch that clock, you go home, the man got to worry about whether the company's going to stay afloat or not. Huh? So I realize, you know, that we, you have to deal with that. There's some women that don't want to work. Now, hey, that's your problem. Don't get upset and mad with me. I'm not the one who got you out there on the job market. So don't get mad with me. If you were mine, you'd be home, well taken care of, dressed down, your heart's desire. So don't get upset with me. All right, I'm not the one who got you out working, okay? All right, let's look at something else. First Peter chapter 3. <laughs> No red. Huh? Get some <laughs> and, 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 and again, uh, just uh, be cool. Don't write me a letter. I know some woman is going to write me a long letter, 19 pages, to, to try to, you know, to try to exonerate herself. Look, I don't, know, I don't even know you're the one working anyway. So if you just keep looking at the television set and smiling, I won't know it's you. And, and I won't tell if you won't tell. And you can do whatever you want anyway. I mean, who am I? I'm just a man. I didn't save you. I didn't redeem you. I'm not going to reward you, and I'm not going to judge you. So if your heart's, you know, if, you, if you're all satisfied in your heart and there's no problem with it, you go keep on doing what you're doing. See, I'm not talking to everybody anyway. I'm only talking to him that hath ears to hear. If you don't have ears to hear, I'm not talking to you. So just lay back and be cool and don't get upset and don't get mad because I'm not even talking to you. The ones that I'm talking to, they know who I'm talking to. And they already got the message. Okay. All right. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. <sighs> Verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. 
Now notice something very important. Well, several things that are very important. Notice it says, likewise ye husbands dwell with them next time because I just ran out of time. Now stay right where you are if this message has been a blessing to you. The announcer will tell you some very important information by which you can obtain an audio cassette of the message which you have just heard for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. Remember that these telecasts and radio broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers and listeners. Remember also these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. This program is now available to you on CD or DVD to share with your family and friends. CD copies are available for your love gift of any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Apostle Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and join us again on the ever-increasing Faith Network, bringing to you the power of faith to transform your life.